Well, greetings. Hope everyone is doing well. So glad you've decided to study God's Word with, with us again. Last time we got through um, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians 13. And I wanted to, to get more, I wanted to get in and finish verse 13 of chapter 13 and finish a point. But I said last week that we would, last time that we would come back and we'd look a little bit more in verses 8 through 13. So if you would, well, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 13. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Love never fails. You follow all these characteristics of love that we, we talked about last time. Love never fails. Faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. You know, love of God is what, what molds us into the likeness of God. We want to be more like God. We, we want to be more like Christ, and we strive to, to do that in our lives. But when we think about verse 11 there, and you think of the difference between a child and, and a man, we think of maturity, what, what we were as a child, what we, what we strive to be as a man or a grown woman, is maturity. For those first century Christians, those, those tongues and, and prophecies, and, and they were to, to help them develop and help spread the word of, of Christ to the first century. But as they matured in individually and collectively, they were able to put these aside as a church and as individuals. But many of these were, were using these gifts at this time without love. And, and Paul tells them that these gifts would be done away with. They would no longer need to cling to these gifts. They, they needed to move on to what was more important. Yes, you know, they needed faith. We need faith. We need hope. But the greatest of these is love. You and I need to keep striving to, to grow. Let's look real quick at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3 and verses 12 and 13. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the time of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Increase and abound in love for one another. That's what God wants for us. He wants us to grow. He wants us to continue to increase and abound. And what's the outcome there? It's, he's, gonna, he's going to establish your hearts without blame. Your heart's going to be full of love. Paul might have been using that analogy when it comes to the spiritual gifts, but back there in 1 Corinthians 13, but, but when you think about people who do not show love, you see someone that is, that is childish in a lot of ways. They, they child, when a child is, is not understanding, they're very selfish sometimes. It's, you know, it's my, mine and I want my way and, and, I, and, and they don't understand a lot of times. They need, they need teaching, they need to grow. But as a mature Christian, we can see for ourselves 
that we have the love of God and the love of God abides in us and, and we need to continue to grow, to abound. We share and, and sacrifice because we abide in God's love and, and we see that around us with our brothers and sisters caring for one another, that, that agape love that could only come through the maturity that, that Paul is, is, is trying to teach. Faith, hope, and love. Paul groups those together. Faith is, you know, conviction of things not seen. And we know hope, not the hope as, as the world knows, but a hope, not a hope that, you know, for this or for that. It's a hope that is a, it, it's a claim, a claim of the future as, as we look, you know, beyond things and for the glory that's to, to come. Love is the goal, which is, which is helped reach by that faith and love. But we have, to, we have to pursue it, and we have to strive to be more like Christ. And that leads us into chapter 14. Look there in the ver very first verse. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Pursue love, Paul says right there. He says, go after it. Seek it. You think about that. Cultivate it in a way. You need to pursue. Like you pursue a degree. Like you, you work towards it. And then it becomes a part of you. Because you're looking to the cross. You're looking to God. You're looking to what he has already done for you. On that day when Christ saved, saved our souls. But God is, you know, excuse me. Paul is not contradicting himself he's still saying love is the more excellent way and we're going to see this as he talks about this because he's talking about the, the what they need to do in in with these spiritual gifts what's really important is to prophesy love is still the more excellent way love is the greatest pursue love but Paul wanted them to do these out of love. Use these gifts out of love. And he goes on to explain why you should desire the gift of prophecy. Look there in verses 2 through 5. For the one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For the one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, for exhortation, and for consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but, the one, but one who prophesies edifies the church. Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets, so that the church may be receive edifying we get the, the the paul is trying to get there that they need he's trying to grow these these corinthians in love he's trying to grow them to see that that what's important with use of these gifts is edification it's exhortation it's consolation the assembly at corinth they all spoke Greek, for the most part. No one there would understand another language, so these words spoken in a tongue were a mystery, Paul says. A tongue we know, tongues we know from Acts 2 and, and 10 were spoken and heard for, for unbelievers in their language, all different kinds of languages we read about. For they're getting the good news. The tongues that were spoke, and I, and I spoke to about this before, in Acts 2.11, would, would speak to the mighty deeds of God. So speaking in tongues wasn't, wasn't doing or helping in the assembly at, at Corinth. It had a different, uh, a different uh, theme to do, but unless it was being interpreted. But what was important? 
prophesying. Prophesying speaks to men for edification, for exhortation, and consolation. Speaking in tongues, Paul says there, edifies himself. But the one who prophesies edifies the church. Remember before we we talked about uh, love edifies. Prophesying edifies. It builds up. And because it's, it's for the assembly's benefit, Paul says, I want you to be able to speak in tongues. But it, it has its use. But prophecy can do these, can build up, can encourage and console. You know, that's why we teach God's words today. Because we want to encourage one another. We want to exhort. We want, to, we want, to, we want people to be built up and, and edified. But... But back then, of course, they didn't have the New Testament. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit, and these things that were spoken that the, through prophecy were pro- being inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it's not someone's interpretation. Uh, it was instruction right from the Holy Spirit. And tongues were not, you know, were not gibberish like we see and, and no offense to some other religions, but, but the gibberish, they were languages that someone could present, could be interpreted for the church's edification. Paul is going to explain more about tongues and, and edification. Let's look at verse 6 through 12. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will it profit you unless I speak to you either by the way of revelation or of knowledge or of prophecy, or of teaching. Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played, on the flute or on the harp? But if the bugle produces an uh, indistinct sound, who who will prepare himself for battle? So also, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There will be perhaps a great many kinds of languages. There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world, and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to you, to the one who speaks a barbarian, And the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So also you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. The edification of the church. Paul's concern is that the tongues were, you know, were becoming a cause for confusion. And the use of, he uses the, the analogy of musical instruments as an illustration. Flute or, or harp, they had an identifiable sound. Someone could identify what was, what was that, that, that was being played. They, they have to be played in, in, on these instruments in such a kind of recognizable and har- harmonious sequence. When you think about playing an instrument, you have to play these correctly to get any pleasure or, or, or listening or melody or, or benefit. Paul's trying to get them to understand that, that tongues not interpreted were pointless. They were speaking into the air, verse 9 says. But a bugle, a bugle played, it has a distinct sound. It would rouse the troops, right? We know that even in today's time we think about that. If the bugle call is not recognizable... The army's not going to re- respond. Paul says, see how important it is that the spiritual gifts that you have in Corinthians were used correctly, used to build up, used to edify. Let's look on in verse 13 through 19. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. 
I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen to, you, to your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you are saying? For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all, than you all. However, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also, rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. The tongue had to be a language that could be interpreted, not babbling, as I said earlier. And whether the singing or the praying, they needed to be done in the framework of, of others understanding what was being said. You know, Paul says you can't be in agreement with something if you, if you don't know what it is you're agreeing with. You can't say amen to something. You can't say I agree with something if you have no clue of what's being said. Bottom line, the tongues were, were to be done in the assembly if interpreted. And Paul, and Paul wanted them to understand that God wants uh, us, his people, when they come in the assembly, to be edified. Paul is continuing to make this point over and over throughout this chapter. Paul wants the, the body to be built up. He's, Paul spoke in tongues more than, than they did. He was an apostle. He went to many places. He would travel, and the Holy Spirit would g give him the gift of tongues that, were, that was needed at the place that he would travel to. But he says there in verse 19, I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct. When I'm in this, the assembly, I want to instruct. I want to encourage. The concern was the instructing and the encouraging and the teaching of his fellow believers. You know, the difference between five words to instruct and 10,000 words in another language. Instructing. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3.16 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. So today, for you and I, the contrast between an unintelligible instruction and intelligible speaking, that's, that's what we want. That's what all of our, our teachers are, are striving to, to do when they teach from God's word, is teach and, and reproof and, and correct and, and train because they, the, the, we want the body to be, to be built up. You know, sometimes we, you know, we, we, we've heard that I didn't get anything out of that lesson today. You know, you think about that. If you didn't get anything out of that lesson, listening to God's word, Scripture right there says all scripture is inspired. There's something that can be gleaned from that. There's something that could be given you encouragement. And, and at the very least, look at your brother that's in front of you that is, is, is striving to help you get closer to God. That's encouraging right there to me. We're going to look at, 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 some, at some more next time. But I want you to look there just a little bit back in 1 Corinthians 14 as we, as we close. You know, um, verse 26, and we're going to get into verse 20, 33 and 40. He talks about all things being done properly. 
all things be being done in order, not in confusion. And, and so now, you know, I, I know for folks that, that may come into the assembly of the, of the Church of Christ for the first time, might have questions. They may, they may not understand you know, we're, why we're doing the things that we are doing, but there's not disorder. There's not confusion. Our Lord doesn't want his worship to be a free-for-all. He wants his people to, to respect and have some reverence when they come together to glorify him and to come together to edify one another. You know, no, no disrespect to, to other religions, but proper and orderly worship is not people running around speaking in unintelligible languages and, and rolling on the floor and, and not knowing you know, what's going on. There's no edification. No verse 12, you know, you think about that. So also, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, seek to abound for edification. Edification of the church. God is glorified with an orderly worship. God is pleased with our edifying and encouraging each other and consoling. Let's look at one last scripture, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 and verse 16. Excuse me, I'm sorry, verse 19. Ephesians 5, verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, Singing, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sounds a lot like edifying there, doesn't it? There's, a, there's, some, beautiful, there's some beautiful psalms and scripture and hymns and singing and making melody. Next time we're going to talk some more about these, this chapter 14 in 1 Corinthians. Paul's going to continue to, to try to instruct the first Corinthians and, and or the first century Corinthians and, and help us understand more. So until next time, may, may God bless you and, and take care.